Hello, everyone. You're listening to Northern Flights, a Park Pro podcast keeping you up to date with the people, tournaments, and culture of disc golf in Canada and beyond. Consider becoming a patron today at patreon.com slash parkpro. Find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by Disc Golf Park. And now your hosts, Andre, Jesse, and Matt. All right, everyone. Welcome to podcast episode 41 of the Northern Flights podcast. Uh, very excited to have you. Uh, we have a special guest. Very special guest. You can see her right here. It's Marie. Um, so we're going to have a, an interview with Marie. She's an uh, occupational therapist, and she's applying her skills to disc golf, which is awesome to see. So uh, we're going to have a great chat with her, and then we're going to talk about uh, the Disc Golf Pro Tour down in Austin. Of course, the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship going on this weekend. Um, there's a few Canadians down there, so uh, interesting to chat about that. And then uh, if we have time, we're going to talk about the weather. As who doesn't love talking about the weather? <laughs> Nearly all I talk about. This week on right. Small Talk, the weather. <laughs> yeah. Followed by uh, living the dream. <laughs> totally. Uh, but yeah, before we get to those conversation pieces, we, of course, will chat with Marie. Um, as mentioned, Marie is a occupational therapist and she recently, um, as last year or two years ago, um, she combined her, her skills as an occupational therapist with her passion for disc golf. Um, she, have, she can be found at the disc golf OT on Instagram and, uh, welcome to the show, Marie. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> There's there. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I just wanted to start off by, um, you know, I just want to talk about your trade. Not a lot of people really, you, you hear the term occupational therapist, and I don't think it's a one that a lot of people really know the definition of. So can you just walk us through uh, your job and then how you were able to apply that to, to, disc, to, to disc golf? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a great question. Um so, yeah, occupational therapy, it often gets kind of confused with other professions like physiotherapy or even like a career counselor because the word occupation is in it. But it has a really interesting history and origin story. It actually dates back to World War I, um, providing rehab to war veterans, like injured uh, soldiers. So it grew out of that and... Actually, both physiotherapy and occupational therapy find their origins in the same place, which is rehabilitating uh, soldiers to get back to being civilians. And occupational therapy um, in its origins, again, like getting back to the beginning, it was linking people with their meaningful occupations. Now, in around World War I, the word occupation had a much broader understanding than it does right now. Um, it meant literally what occupies your time. So like a hobby, but also if you th think in a 24 hour window, what occupies our time as humans is a variety of things. It's broader than work. And it includes like eating, sleeping, driving, socializing, working, playing. And so it's across the lifespan and it's like 24 hours from, uh, Cradle to grave is like one way it's been put. So really it can work with anyone. And it appealed to me because um, I kind of was thinking about this earlier really today. I've always gravitated towards my passion and my passion has always been something niche that is kind of poorly marketed or poorly understood. So like my undergraduate degree was in psychology. Most people assume psychologists can read people's minds and that's not true. And then I did like a research master's in psychiatry and then people are like, oh, so you're becoming a psychiatrist. I'm like, no, I'm studying research and I'm passionate about suicide prevention. So then I want to work more with people. So that's why I didn't stay on the research track but mental health has always been my passion and it's part of the scope of practice for OT. So that's why I chose it over physiotherapy, for example. And it's very practical. Um, it's non-pharmacological, like no medications are prescribed. And yeah, so like disc golf, for example, is an occupation. It's something that occupies our time. 
yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and I, I, I guess um, just to expand on it a little bit, when did you decide to sort of officially combine your passion for disc golf? Um, and actually, why don't we go uh, even for, back further than that and and ask how you got into disc golf in the first place and then kind of work up to, to yeah. how you were able to get to the point you are now? Yeah, no, that's a great question too. So I first got into disc golf when I was living in Edmonton, actually, Matt Lysak. Um, I My first course that I ever played with not a proper disc, I was throwing like a cheap freebie Crocs Frisbee that chipped on one of the baskets um, at Rundle Park. <laughs> I was like, what is this? But we saw like uh, my boyfriend at the time, uh, we went to that course again with like this cheap free frisbee and we saw people throwing discs and we're like okay well i guess this is what we do but um yeah that was my first uh, experience of disc golf and then um when i was an ot student i did my mental health practicum in red deer and i noticed when i was taking public transit there was all these like red painted kind of uh, UFO looking baskets <laughs> in all their like community parks and playgrounds. And I recognized that those were the same basket, well, not the same manufacturer, obviously, like the person who made that actually, I was told makes playground equipment. But anyways, that was like my next immersion into disc golf was I'm like, oh, here's this sport again. And so then at that point, um, my boyfriend, he researched uh, proper discs. And so my first disc is, I still have it, a titanium um, Nate Doss Buzz SS. And so that was my first disc. And I went to practice while he was away on at work, um, working on the rigs. Uh, and, and then, like, I'll never forget, like, I was by myself, went to this park in Red Deer, because, like, I swear, like, in terms of exposure, it felt like every single public park or school yard had baskets. And so I was kind of trying to play them all. But, yeah, one day I went by myself to practice, and there was this group, and it was, like, men and women. And one of the women actually was Andrea Leesk. I didn't know her name at the time. She lent me a disc and I was like, that really left a positive impression on me. I'm like, wow, this isn't like ball golf, which I don't play at all, like competitively or even really pseudo recreationally. Um, and I was like, this feels like really down to earth and not pretentious like ball golf. So like that combination of like the people and then the playfulness and the uh, opportunity to explore, like I remember the talking about like the wizards course. And now I know that th that is organic sports ranch, which I finally got to play two years ago. So it's just like, that's, that's the origin. And that was pre pandemic. So this is like 2017, 2018. And then I knew that I was probably going to move back to BC if my relationship at the time ended. And so when it did, I'm like, okay, I'm moving back to BC and I'm going to use disc golf to make friends. And because when I would go back to my families, like I'm from the West Kootenays in BC, when I would go back to visit family, my dad is such a trooper. <laughs> like he went with me to Thin Air and Rossland. We played that course together um, and the Weimar course. And yeah, it was when I was on those courses, I saw groups of other people playing and like the diehards with like the big ba big backpacks with the discs. And, and I remember thinking even back then, like, I'm never going to be like that. Like, that's like over the top. And here I am. <laughs> I'm one of those players <laughs> trying to liquidate by selling discs on the hub. So yeah, I, I just, that was like, it just, I, yeah, it was curiosity that got me into the sport because, again, seeing like this UFO like uh, basket on courses and then learning it's a sport and then people are down to earth and it's free to play for the most part. So that's how I got into it. And I guess, um, yeah, to continue with Andre's question, when in that timeline did you decide that OT would be a good thing to mix into the, the disc golf dream you were living? Yeah, thanks, Jesse, for reminding me of that. So, yeah, I didn't answer that part of the question yet. Um, it was actually when 
I, it's kind of hard to pin down, but I, I remember distinctly when I completed Seth Munsey's Disc Golf Strong program, there were some elements in the mental game part where I'm like, oh, this reminds me of like when working with children and teaching like um, emotions, um, the zones of regulation. He used like something similar in like his explanations of the mental game, like with different colors to recognize when you're like in the warning, um, when you need to be a little bit more concerned or something similar to like this visual where it's like, this is a Canadian um, mental health continuum model, but just like basic color coding of like, oh, am I healthy? Am I reacting? Am, am I like mentally injured? Am I becoming mentally ill? So it's like, anyways, so it just, that I think was when it got me thinking about it. And then I got deeper into it when I received mental skills coaching, like as a client from Dane Anderson. He wrote several PDGA articles and he's a counselor in the States. And when he was completing like his PhD in like sports psychology or his clinical counseling uh, designation, um, he was advertising for pretty cheap at the time, like $25 US mental game sessions. And so I signed up for those and I was so keen. I, I was like, I want to get like his mental performance consultancy certification. And so when I emailed like the contact for that, I was really disappointed that despite my long history of like mental health um, training, whether it's like my degrees or additional certifications I've taken, um, that American I think at the national body, actually, it doesn't recognize OTs as like eligible mental health providers to have that designation. So that made me uh, angry and kind of lit the fire of like more advocacy work needs to be done for my profession, not only in Canada, but in the US and around the world, because my dream is for to create a niche like through my the disc golf OT um, using my passion sport, disc golf, illustrate how OTs are well equipped, just like psychologists and physiotherapists are to work with athletes. So. And that was one of the questions that kind of developed in my brain as you were going through that. Um, and for those of us that aren't as well versed in it, do you mind kind of describing the difference between, say, an occupational therapist and a sports psychologist and what the use yeah. cases for both would be? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think sports psychology is, like there's gonna be some overlap, I think, in some, terms of techniques uh, because OTs are, um, we're el like our profession is eligible to take some of the same training, like whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, even polyvagal, if anyone's heard of that, like, um, but I would say that in terms of, um, a big difference is oh, occupational therapy isn't a talk therapy, it's a doing therapy. So like there's a place for talking, but at the end of the day, we want to see people doing what they're doing and what they want to get back to doing. So I remember one of my mentors said like, if it's, um, if it, like if an activity or occupation works, it's therapy, if it doesn't work, then it's assessment. Like it's giving us information on like, what else does this person need to learn how to do? Um, or what kind of like coping strategies or compensatory mechanisms do we need to put in place in order for this person to participate in it? So I'd say it's a, like a lot of exposure therapy um, because like it is very applied and hands-on and not just like um, talking about one's day without like challenging those limits, like in a real applied sense. So, mm. yeah. yeah I, I think I understand. And maybe to go one step further, say I have bad putting in tournaments. If I go to see a sports psychologist, we're going to talk about the, the process in which things happen, where you will, they put yourself in more high pressure situations or something that's more tangible than just a conversation. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, like maybe there are some sports psychologists that walk the course with d athletes they work with. I imagine they can have that applied uh, format. Um, but uh, yeah, an OT will also look at like in the 24 hour window, what other things do we need to work on with an athlete, whether it's like their sleep routine or ergonomics with like how they travel, like when they're in a car or um, flying um, or even just like, emotion regulation skills it's huge in disc golf like being able to retain your cool going back to the green zone when you're like whoa on this end like that's like a skill set and um yeah and then there's like the physical piece too like we're like OTs are trained in neuroscience. We're also trained in anatomy. So like we can specialize in like hand therapy and grip is like a big part of disc golf. So let's say someone has a hand injury, like there can be an OT with specialized hand therapy training that can help a person rehabilitate or even in terms of like prevention, like not everything is reactionary, setting things up so that a person is less likely to develop like repetitive strain injuries or, um, or back pain again with like how they carry their bag or routines. And then two, like I got into it more with my first webinar focusing on women, but um, like pacing oneself in the sport of disc golf or any sport is like really important for the long game and preventing burnout. So I, as a disc golfer and avid volunteer in the community, I have experienced like burning out and I just want, felt like when I received OT for burnout as a profession, I'm like, I wish more people had access to this information. Like it shouldn't just be like this um, a privileged path of access. So to make um, it, it a bit more equitable for everybody, that's part of uh, the driver to my series is to expose people at like a much more affordable rate than like private pay OT, which is very similar to like a psychologist these days um, and may or may not be covered because insurance providers don't recognize OT like they do physio. Um, yeah, just give disc golfers access to information that they might not get otherwise. Yeah. It's, it seems very interesting because you're dealing with both the mental and the physical side where I don't think totally. a lot of people would have realized that if they hadn't been exposed to an experience with an OT before. Um, you yeah. touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. But, Sorry. Uh, I was going to say uh, your webinar series you're just talking about. You've got uh, one in the can and two on the calendar so far. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have like ideas of other OTs that I want to interview like for example footwear is something that I learned about in OT school I'm like okay let's let's get like the the good material out there because there's a lot of different opinions and I, and you know having a background in science and research I always like to know okay where's the credible source of information so yeah, that's a topic I want to pursue in the future too, is interviewing an OT who's taken specialized training in like footwear to like provide suggestions for disc golfers when they're choosing and selecting footwear, um, not just based on the trends or some uh, disc golfer who's sponsored saying like, this is what I wear, so wear it. It's like, I don't know if that's enough of a case for uh, footwear. The fandom in disc golf is such that a lot of people will take whatever their favorite player is wearing as a blind recommendation that that's what yes. they need to be doing. And I know the uh, the barefoot trend is starting to get a lot bigger in disc golf. And I know that's definitely not for everybody getting, you know, flattened arches and plantar fasciitis and things like that. Um, oh, totally. But to, to tie it back to the... Um, Webinar series, is that the kind of approach you're taking with the webinars such that it's kind of a general topic I'll have an expert on for a limited amount of time instead of like a broad scope thing? It's let's hit this yeah. kind of one topic hard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want to like interview OTs that are experts in different areas that I feel are relevant to disc golfers. So like I, you were trying to ask me earlier and then I went on my rabbit trail. It was, uh, yeah, the, the mental game webinar series. Initially, when I thought of it last year, I, I was kind of meek and shy about my profession. And I was like, I don't know, like kind of 
professionally a bit of imposter syndrome where I'm like, I don't know what OT has to offer that psychologists and counselors can't. But it was even Dane Anderson, again, that same clinical counselor was like, Marie, you can talk about this. You don't need me. So I was like, okay, well, I still don't really want to do all the talking. I really enjoy interviewing people and being a student, having a learner's beginner's mindset. So um, yeah, I think Finally, this year, I had the courage of like, you know what, uh, OT has a lot to offer to the mental game. And if I'm going to make a case for OT working with athletes, this is how I have to do it is like show all the different areas that we can apply our knowledge and scope. So, yeah. Yeah, someone always has to kind of take that first step. You don't know how OT is going to affect disc golf and you, you've got to be the one yeah. to, to take yeah. that jump off into the deep end. Yeah, yeah, and and I'd love to it to get to the point professionally where it is like um, where I don't have to spend like an elevator pitch to explain OT, where it's as well known and recognized and sought off after as teachers, doctors, lawyers, etc., accountants. Like you know, there's so many professions where people ha don't have to study it to know what it is. So. Sounds like something that with these million dollar contracts that are floating around, someone that you might want to not necessarily have on your own private staff, but someone with like a regular check into your disc golf game. I know they're, they're seeing sports psychologists, specific trainers for physical and mental things across the board. And um, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think of a time it wouldn't be good. Like I would have never even thought of ergonomics in travel for mm -hmm. myself, but how often do I get out of the car with a sore back and then go straight to the first tee and throw as hard as I can? You know, right. can't be good and uh, yeah no sports psychologist is going to tell you to sit up straight I don't think uh, yeah on your drive to Vancouver or something yeah they, they might not and like even ergonomics like the French word for occupational therapist is ergotherapeut which like has the same root like as ergonomics like so it's kind of neat that on the one hand OT has difficulty marketing itself and maybe needs a rebrand but on the other hand it shows like inklings that it's like oh well this is how how it works yeah or how it can be applied i'm gonna pass it off to somebody else to get a question in because i've been hogging you but um last one is just a quick if there's three things in ot a, a disc golfer should consider let's say a tournament level disc golfer what do you think those top three things are to walk into Marie Disc Golf OT's office. These are the most important things to look into. Oh, wow. That is so hard to answer because, like, the scope of OT is so big. But I would start with, like, pay attention to your sleep schedule. If you want to perform, like, what is your sleep, sleep schedule like? That's impacted with your sleeping setup, whether it's an Airbnb or camping. Um, and then... I would also look at, um, as an OT, oh, this is really a good question, Jesse, is if a person has like issues with certain things, like, in terms, like the physical part of the game, because there's like physical skills and mental skills, you kind of touched on that earlier, um, an OT can help assess which what's the source there? Is it like self-limiting thoughts that are getting in the way? Or is there actually some like basic coordination skills that a person needs to learn that they didn't learn growing up? Like speaking for myself, I don't have an athletic background. I had pretty much like an intellectual upbringing. The most active thing I did growing up with my family was hiking, which that's part of the reason why I love disc golf because it's a lot of hiking and walking. But in terms of like the uh, gross motor skills and eye-hand coordination skills that disc golf requires, that which OT can assess. Um, I didn't grow up th like playing catch with a frisbee, so for me, generating spin, which is like the foundation of disc golf <laughs> as a sport, because uh, as uh, my partner has described to me before, he's more physics and engineer minded than I am, so I. I appreciate how he explains things because yeah, disc golf, like we, it's our body that generates the movement. It's not, there's not something else that we're relying on that affects like the outcome of the disc. Like with ball golf, there's that intermediate 
object of the club. And it's like, yeah, you have to adjust the angle of that too, but it does, it's not, it doesn't require the same, I hope I'm explaining this clearly, but there's like, there's some clear differences between like the spin on the ball that's generated by the force of the club versus like the spin that I'm generating on this disc because of what's my grip. And also, yeah, I hope I explained that. So, um, yeah, I would say that's the second area I would go in because like that's where, yeah, the physical piece and then like the mental piece of like the performance can come from both areas and it really sucks when it is both. Like it's like self negative self-talk and like certain movement, gross motor movement skills that need to be worked on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm both to be honest, <laughs> where it's like my mental game is weak and my physical game is weak. So, but there's a there's still like skill development, everything. That's what, I guess to summarize what OT is all about, it's about skill development, whether it's like visual skills, like um, how our eyes work, um, or whether it's like, again, eye-hand coordination or um, awareness of body positioning, like proprioception, or interoception means like a person's ability to know their own body signals and respond, whether it's hunger s signals or heart rate signals that can, you know, be biofeedback to oneself of like, oh, I'm nervous or, you know, uh, that's, that's a, I hope I answer that. <laughs> and so I feel like I just got to like point two, but I was really trying to split into like, um, yeah, sleep and then physical and mental. So. Yeah, I, I like that uh, se second bit because I'm thinking about like the early release backhand. Are you actually oh, yes. physically not turning em enough or do yeah. you have anxiety about grip locking it? And that the problem oh, yeah. is one way manifesting itself there, but it could be either or or both. Yeah, I have both. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, Jesse, I've got, I've yeah, got bad news for you. You're, you're coordinated enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, I have to book a session after this, I think. <laughs> but yeah. And then maybe the last area too that I should touch on, which is like the bonus fourth in terms of the top three, is like, because um, like the Canadian model of occupational performance and engagement, it has like a person in the center, and so like the OT will look at a person's physical, affective, or mood. Um, cognitive, which is like how their mind works, like the neuroscience piece, but also like their core beliefs or spirituality or like way of looking at the world. And then how a person interacts with the, the occupation that we're focusing on. So like disc golf, for some people it is self-care. It is self-care for me. For some people it's productivity because it, it's paid employment. And for other people, it's um, leisure, like a hobby. So I'm trying to make it be all three, self-care, productivity, and le leisure. And then it's like how the person participating in occupation or uh, disc golf, how that uh, interfaces with a person's environment, whether it's like the particular course you're playing or it's your social environment or it's like the provincial um, or national environment that you're in like disc golf in Finland versus the States versus Thailand versus Mexico like all those kinds of things and then the, like the cultural piece too of like what disc golf can look like in different settings like I know there's some courses I've played where I feel more safe to be alone as a woman and others where I don't. So there's that, that kind of example. So <laughs> I'm curious, you've dealt with a number of people, I'm sure. Um, how would you compare like the, the occupation of a professional athlete in an individual sport like disc golf um, versus other professions? Like are, have you run across any other professions that have a similar set of uh, challenges like I'm, I'm thinking like tree planters, professional musicians, traveling salespeople. Like, what what are some yeah. of the professions you've run across that have some of the same challenges that being a athlete in a like a uh, individual sport would have? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. It's funny you listed musicians because when I went into OT, that was another area I wanted to specialize in, was working with musicians. Um, I'm like, oh, that would be a lot of fun. I think um, I honestly, when I work professionally with people, I don't necessarily know what their paid employment is or like it's kind of, um, or I, okay, let me rephrase that. When I work with adults, then yes, I do, but let, it depends on the setting. If I worked in a hospital or I've, my first job was at a prison, I didn't know what people's jobs were. Like they're, they're in a hospital or now they're in a prison environment. Like I just, that was kind of irrelevant. It was more like, well, who is this person in front of me? What did they value? What are they trying to accomplish in their life? And how can I support them? We're like, what kind of skills do they need in order to achieve that? Or what kind of physical rehab or modifications do they need in order to recover, to participate? I think um, getting back to your question, like, yeah, because I don't necessarily know the professions uh, that people are in unless they are like in the example of like WorkSafe BC, then yes, I know the job they're returning to, or let's say it's a car accident and it's an ICBC claim. Yes, then I probably know what their work is. And then um, I'd say I kind of like remember back in my undergrad, there was a classmate of mine that had a physical disability, but I felt like mental attitude was a bigger disability and I think like across any profession <laughs> disc golfers included myself included um, our attitude in life can be a bigger disability than with whatever physical thing we're facing there are some people out there with some crazy limits whether it's like Paralympians or motivational speakers who don't have legs and like or you know have dwarfism or some rare genetic disorder and they're thriving so I honestly think that yeah one's mental attitude can have a bigger determining factor in one's quality of life even though yes I'm going to acknowledge socioeconomic variables but like let's just make a general I'm going to make a generalization here that in my own personal experience, uh, attitude. Like, just to give a concrete example, when I was working at a hospital and it was like hip and knee replacement, uh, quick in and out education every day, I remember one of the nurses telling me there was someone in the hospital that day that didn't need pain meds. And they just had like a joint replacement. This person, I think, was middle-aged. And I was like, that is cool. I want to meet more people like that, where they've done some sort of mental training before they got here to not need drugs. Like, there's a place for medication. I'm not anti-drug completely, but I think uh, drugs, and that's just part of the reason why I didn't choose a profession where it's like, give me the quick fix, because a quick fix often doesn't get to the root issue. Even psychologists will tell you that. Like... Lots of people want the quick fix in life, including disc golf, and I'm also guilty of that sometimes. Uh, when I complain about my progress, I know it's because a part of me wants the quick fix, but really I have to put in the work to learn the physical skills, the mental skills, um, the, the health habits like nutrition, training, sleep habits, even like social skills of boundaries, like saying no to things that aren't going to serve my big picture goal. It's hard. And like, it's all about growth in life. We're all trying to grow in our own directions. And at the end of the day, OT is a, a profession that can support people and disc golfers in growing in the sport of disc golf, if that's what they want. That's, that's awesome. There's a lot there. Um, something that we've talked about for a few episodes is that disc golf seems to be the, the mental side of disc golf is challenging because the goal of a lot of holes, especially at the professional level is to birdie and to, if you birdie a hole, it's a success, it's a success and everything else is a failure. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people went, when the people who are winning are getting, you know, more birdies than pars, 
um, anybody else in the field is sort of seeing a lot of failure in their round. And so it's um, mm -hmm. disc golf, especially at the higher levels, can be, you know, a lot of feeling of failure, even though uh, that's not necessarily the case. So do you think that's the case with disc golf? Do you think that's unique to disc golf? And um, are we looking at this the right way? Is there like a level of mm -hmm. perfectionism that can be healthy and productive? Or do you think that uh, people that sort of look at their rounds that way need to maybe start reframing things? Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, what you said there is that, and like my partner and I have discussed this too, that disc golf is pretty unique that way that because it is an individual sport, unless you're playing on a team like match play or like representing your country, the, like the responsibility depends on you. It depends on your body. It depends on your mind, like your performance, like there is a lot of variables that are out of our control when we release the disc. So there is that balance of like, well, I'm in interacting with like the environment of the course. So, and the variables of like wind and terrain and all elevation, et cetera. And branches that but move it, it, after you throw your disc. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think like perfectionism is like an unhealthy mental habit that a lot of athletes have in general. And um, everyone has like their own kind of personal um, work that they need to do and how they want to find like a healthy relationship with it. Because I know for myself, like I, I'll be up front, like I've received counseling before and um, I... I remember when my counselor said, like, even just to reframe, like, don't, I shouldn't be calling myself a perfectionism, perfectionist, sorry, um, because, like, then I make it part of my identity, and then it's kind of like a cop-out and an excuse for, like, well, this is just, like, how I think all the time. Whereas if I say, like, I have perfectionism, it's some, like, that's what she suggested to me, is then it's more likely that I can create some, like, a mental distance from it decrease like the emotional charge I have with it and also recognize that it's something I need to address and work on. Like it's, it can be a double-edged sword and just, yeah, walking that fine line of like wanting to excel and be the best at something, but then also recognize my own personal limits as a human being. Like, yeah, we're, change is the only thing that's constant. <laughs> so. Awesome. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from our conversation is that um, you're not even necessarily talking about a professional professional disc golfers. You're, we're talking about um, disc golfers of all skill levels, which is awesome. Yeah. And I think that's one of the cool things about this um, the, these webinars that you're hosting this year, which, I mean, we should touch on a little bit more. You're hosting this uh, Unlock Your Mental Game series. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. and I think if you could just, yeah, maybe just touch on that and, and let us know how you're coming out with these and, and how often you'll be doing them. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse and, uh, Andre and Matt for like redirecting me back to like the original question. I got. I am like very much a stream of consciousness type person when I answer questions. That's all good. Um, Those are the best interviews. So yeah. <laughs> good. So yeah, Andre, getting back to the question, the webinar series, yeah, I want to um, focus on different areas that I think will be relevant to the mental game. So I, last year I actually did a survey, I uh, tried to focus on Canadian disc golfers and just to see like, well, what are the areas that disc golfers need support with? And I developed that survey in collaboration with Dane Anderson, the clinical counselor from the States. And I notice quite a bit of responses about um, issues with focus and attention. And it made me think of ADHD. I'm not saying everyone who has those issues has ADHD. Probably the majority don't. But it just got me thinking about like, oh, well, OTs work like with adults and kids with ADHD. I bet there's some things here that we could offer disc golfers that can help um, with the mental game piece. So yeah, the first one um, in the mental game series, I'm going to be interviewing an OT. Uh, her name's Carla Neek. She's in Alberta. And actually before the webinar, she's planning on playing around in Calgary. So just to do us a bit of 
field research, I guess her husband already plays. And so I connected her with a disc golfer in Calgary and so that's her homework. And um, yeah, she's a OT entrepreneur, podcaster, and she herself is an adult and a mom and a wife with uh, ADHD herself. And so like, she's pretty open about that piece. I actually got to know her because I attended her um, OT for ADHD-ish business owners. And even though I, I wasn't a business owner at the time, I'm like, I think I might have ADHD. I think I could learn some things here. And I just found it really valuable. And again, it was another instance where like, I wish more people had access to this information. So that's why I'm like, Carlin, do you want to be interviewed? <laughs> and she's like, sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to focus on like, mental game strategy specific to like maintaining focus um, during while playing disc golf and probably mostly like in a tournament setting because that when I did the survey that was like a lot of the examples that people were listing um, or it just not playing alone because I know for myself like solo practice rounds are a completely different experience than when I play with other people and sometimes it really like gets under my skin that I can be, have such a like night and day performance when I'm playing alone versus with other people. And it's like clearly a mental game thing. So I was like, I, I, I still wrestle with this area. I'm curious what kind of um, insights Carlin's gonna share on this. And then, so that's April 8th. Um, there's still plenty of time and room for people to register. My first one was for women, but this one is for everybody. It's for all ages, it's for kids, it's for men and women. And, and so anyone who's interested who wants to attend and then the like technology requirements are Zoom, uh, just need a free account. And I don't, because I've attended a bunch of webinars myself, I know what I like and I dislike. So I'm not gonna require that people have to have their video on because not everyone's comfortable with that. So like if people wanna just like tune, like listen to the audio and like type in the chat their questions, that's fine, you can be anonymous, that's okay. So I just encourage people to register and attend live because to support my hometown, Castlegar, BC, there's a disc dyer there named Dylan Canoe Smith, also goes by Death Putt Disc Dyes. So for every webinar, I'm gonna be giving away uh, one of his discs, so um, yeah. Yeah, we yeah have a he couple. did that for you guys, it looks so yes. sharp. He yeah, might be the, the best disc dyer in Canada. Oh, yeah. And he's made some of the best stuff I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, we just saw one on screen, so. Yeah, it's probably so the best disc skilled. in Canada. <laughs> and speaking of Park Pro logos, I didn't show it yet since we start recording, but I have my Park Pro hydration right here. Yes. Yes, we appreciate that. Marie, <laughs> you've always been a strong supporter of Park Pro, so we really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, um, is there yeah. anything you wanted to touch on i know uh people can find you at uh as we mentioned off the top uh the disc golf ot on instagram mm -hmm. is there anywhere else that people can get a hold of you and find out more information about all this stuff yeah uh if people want to email me they can send me send me an email at the disc golf ot at gmail.com um i have facebook but it's still like my personal one so like i prefer instagram the disc golf ot or you can send me an email at uh the disc golf ot at gmail.com otherwise i hope to see a lot of people at tournaments this year too so very yeah. well <laughs> yeah definitely uh uh give maria a follow and check out those webinars and if somebody wants to work with you as an ot i imagine you, are you able to work with people remotely, uh, like across Canada in the U S as well? Is this really, is it exclusively like an in-person, um, yeah. type of therapy? Great question. Um, for the pandemic, um, and when I was in OT school, I did a private practice module and I knew that because I was receiving counseling by teletherapy and this is before the pandemic. I'm like, OTs can do this and we can do it better because we can assess way more than just talking. So to answer your question, um, I am licensed to practice in BC. So unfortunately, like that restricts me to only see people, including online. 
in the province of BC. Although Alberta, I think it does allow me to see um, people that live in Alberta, but via telehealth. Uh, same with the states. Like I couldn't see anyone in the states unless I was licensed in their state. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of red tape, which is a little irritating. Uh, I think that's why a number of OTs, including Carlin, uh, they also do coaching because coaching isn't, there's no regulatory body, which kind of like in terms of quality control, it's hard then to find someone that is actually a good coach. Um, but yeah, so, but I to also answer your question, Matt, I want to mention that for my my Instagram and my webinar series, it has two purposes. One is to like translate knowledge and science of OT to disc golfers so that it's like accessible, but it's also marketing for OTs that I interview. So I'm less interested in being someone's OT and more interested in um, increasing the general public's and specifically disc golfers' understanding of OT and then connecting them with OTs that I interview if, if it seems like a good fit for them. So I'm trying to like trailblaze um, OTs working with athletes and I'm using disc golf as like my choice but or my chosen like sport to focus on but I don't see myself as being like the therapist anymore. I see myself as like um, the marketer or change agent to bring a broad, bring about like, yeah, OTs being hired by sports teams, whether it's the NHL, football, professional golfers, professional disc golfers, like there's a role for OTs. And actually my first OT that I interviewed, she's the one that I saw for burnout recovery. And when I asked her to be interviewed, she said, Oh, it was my dream to work with like the Philadelphia Eagles. Like that's her favorite football team. And like she's played disc golf too, but um, yeah. And then I, I should also mention that like my second webinar date is TBD because she's super high demand. She travels the world training people on like trauma informed like occupational therapy. And she herself is also like a trailblazer for OT and has already kind of set the bar for working with athletes because she herself, her name is Kim Barthel. Um, she lives in Victoria, BC when she's not traveling around. She's already worked with like a, an athlete. His name's Theo Fleury. Um, and uh, yeah, so he's like a very famous uh, hockey player and she's helped him with like his recovery through addictions and trauma so they actually if anyone's interested um he, he, they have like a really easy to read book called conversations with the rattlesnake and it's basically like verbatim their interview of each other so it's like really easy to read and get into and it's like this is an example of an ot working with an athlete and he chose her because he heard her speak one day and he's like it wasn't even a question it was like a demand like I need you to work with me. So it was pretty cool. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That being said, who's your favorite disc golfer? <laughs> who's my favorite disc golfer? Yeah. Uh, Kristen Tatar. Okay. If Kristen Tatar called you up and said, <clears throat> listen, I, uh, there's OT regulations in Estonia, but can I hire you as a, as a job coach? Would you say yes? Yeah, I definitely would. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, but I, I, she has a pretty good mental game, though. I think she's like yeah. a well-rounded athlete. Yeah. He's Every, known for, for listening to this podcast, though. So, yeah, she's a big oh. fan. Um, well, it, it might be worth reaching out to some of the manufacturers, you know, like uh, for if you're not, you know, looking to expand your, your practice specifically, maybe other OTs might be worth reaching out yeah. to manufacturers because like maybe that should be a perk that some of these manufacturers would want to offer to their sponsored athletes, right? Yeah, totally. I, I think I heard that Thomas Gilbert one year, he negotiated in his contract to make sure he had access to like a physiotherapist. I don't know if it included sports psychologists, but no, I completely agree. Like, or even just to have like OTs as your caddy, like that would be awesome. I'd love to be 
someone's caddy and just having even like standardized uh, caddy training that includes like um, a lot of the science that occupational therapists are trained in um, could be pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining the show. We really appreciate oh, thanks you coming for on. Me. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening and redirecting me with your questions. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, any day over the one word answer, people. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Like, Maria, are you doing a webinar series? Yes. yes. Never. You gave us so much good information. So much. I have it on my shirt too. I, I can't, I think for you though, it's like backwards. So it's like, you know, reading ambulance. Through the rear view. It's coming, came in forwards for us. Yeah, I mean, it looks I think good. We're we're good. Good. This, we're good. Yes. For our audio listeners, this year, this year unlock your mental game. Yes. With Marie. Also, go to the YouTube disc golf OT. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much, Marie. And hopefully, uh, maybe we'll have a little follow up at the end of the year. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, see, see how far I get uh, with. Uh, the webinars i did have one person ask if i have a subscription i'm like oh that's flattering but i don't yet have like the attendance to justify yet. it <laughs> so, yet. Yet. <laughs> awesome yeah. thanks marie yeah. yeah thank you that was a fantastic interview with uh, marie uh i was so excited to have her on we don't get a lot to t we don't get to talk about the mental side and and you know really it's kind of i didn't really know how all encompassing the occupational therapist um, trade was so it awesome conversation reach out to her uh follow her on instagram because you know that's some there's some really good value there and um you know hopefully uh Hopefully those webinars get uh, are well received and and she can continue to bring that to the disc golf world. So, uh, absolutely, that's it was such an interesting interview and something that I don't think we've I've seen uh, on any other disc golf podcast. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, suck at Smashbox. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, we should take care of some housekeeping here. Uh, of course, this episode is brought to you by Disc Golf Park. And Disc Golf Park, it's a unique disc golf course concept developed in Finland in 2005. It is based on the idea of building sports facilities in an environmentally friendly way. Disc Golf Park provides great experiences for players of all skill levels from beginners to professionals. Our main ideology is to introduce disc golf to new audiences, there are several options to suit any kind of course, and all official disc golf parks include professional and safe course design, disc golf park pro targets, tee pads and tee signs, and an info board to welcome players to your course. The disc golf park world concept consists of multiple courses designed for different types of players. Multi golf is a fun new activity for the whole family, and in multi golf, three forms of golf are played: foot golf, disc golf, and park style pitch and putt. School Disc Golf Park offers students a new and exciting form of exercise for the physical education classes. Course suitable for schools can be designed even in a small area, for instance, a schoolyard. Furthermore, the costs of School Disc Golf Park are lower than those of regular Disc Golf Parks. We also offer private and group lessons or clinics. For more information, check out the website at discgolfpark.com and request a quote today. I'm happy to announce that my talking is kind of back to normal in a way. If you don't didn't know I was missing a tooth and I had a little bit of a lisp. A tooth back as of today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I have found that my I got kind of got used to talking that way. And that's <laughs> like I have to relearn to talk with that tooth back in place. So uh, I appreciate you guys asking a, a number of the questions with Marie because it uh, helped me not talk as much. Did it, was it involved? Like, did you? Just spent a long time in the chair to get that puppy put back on. It wasn't that bad. I got in on a cancellation, and it, it was probably an hour, and and the whole appointment from like him is being like, I don't know what to do here. Um, he literally said like my the little bit of root canal that was left was too small to like really do anything with. Um, <laughs> when you're in the middle of a uh, dental work, and they like he ground out all the crappy tooth, and. He looks at his at, at the dental assistant and he's like, go get me this and this and this. And then he's like, oh, wait, let's do something crazy. Oh, no, I never like, want to hear that from a dentist. I was ever. like, what? <laughs> what? I, I course, always wanted to try this. 
Yes. <laughs> of course, I was like, I like crazy. I put the drill in your mouth, but this time I'm going to put the freezing in my mouth. (laughs) Oh, thank you. But the nice thing was that afterwards, he's like, uh, I don't remember her name, but she's like, so, so, uh, make a note. This worked really well. And like, so crazy good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was my dental experience. In communist Russia, canal roots you. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) Yeah, it was great. He's a yeah new 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 dentist in town and had a it was I wanted to give him a chance, you know. Pretty yeah. happy with it. It's mm-hmm. pretty good. You know how in surgery, like um, let's say you get Tommy John surgery or something, they take a tendon from your leg and like put it into your elbow, or like if you're having a skin graft or something like that, oftentimes they'll take skin from your leg. Did they take? T- the part of your tooth from your leg, or did they have to use somebody else's tooth that was donated? I think this is just, it's all big stuff. It's like, a, I think, I actually don't know. I'm trying to, I always try to picture what they're doing. I think they squeeze it into a, like a tube and it's just like a paste. Did they, so like, like, did they probably, reference pictures, like photos of you before the uh, incident? Yeah. Really? So they were like, oh, really? They're just eyeballing it? They're like, well, I guess they yeah. can compare it to its, you know, twin brother across the way. Yeah, and I think the, the the interesting thing was the assistant was like, that's a good-looking tooth. You know, you really did a good form on that. So I'm like, is there such a, like, do you do a bad job on these sometime? Like, I don't know. It's kind of funny. Kind of a funny situation. He's like, I'm going to try something crazy this time. No fangs. <laughs> yeah. I think it had to do with how they were wedging. And sorry if this gets a little graphic for people, but he basically took two wedges and just like put wedges inside my gums beside the existing tooth. Just made these giant holes so that he could like go around it with the filling. There you go. So it didn't take it from your leg is what you're saying? No. Okay. All right. Not that in depth. Hmm. Not did he, that crazy. Did he like tell you about you know? Really, I I wanted to be Michelangelo and carve marble statues, and this is the closest <laughs> I got when I dropped out of yeah. art school. He, yeah. he flunked out of art school and had to settle for dental school, probably. Yeah, totally. Uh, but we can't talk job. about disc golf. What? I thought this was the tooth podcast. <laughs> yeah. Northern uh, bites. We did... A podcast about dental work. <laughs> Um, if, speaking of dental work, Canada health care plan is going to include dental for certain income people. So, um, just a side note. Anyways, we did have some disc golf go down last weekend. Uh, the open at Austin uh, happened and we're just going to quickly run through some winners. Uh, Nicholas Antilla and own Scoggins winning their divisions. Uh, own just dominated. He did great. It was awesome to see. Um, and it's awesome to see Nicholas doing really well to start the season as well. Well, it was two monumentous occasions. It's the first major win for anybody from Finland. Um, In MPO? And it was also, yes. Uh, yes. Evelina won earlier this season, didn't she? Yeah. Was that a major? Oh, this wasn't a major. Away. Oh, you're right. This weekend is a major. That's what I'm getting wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first MPO Finland. Elite Series. Yeah, Elite Series. I knew there was a name I was missing attached to it. <laughs> and Own shot the highest rated tournament by an FPO of all time, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why Own doesn't get enough respect. I think we overvalue people that can chuck a Frisbee a mile. Because Own Scoggins has now been the second highest rated disc golfer in FPO in the world for like well over a year at this point, I think. Long time. Yeah since Paige Pierce um, dropped off a little bit, and consistently, consistently plays well. Consistently plays well at courses where you think she's going to play well, and plays well at courses where you're like, well, this is not an Owen Scoggins course. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I think she possesses a lot of the good characteristics that uh, we were talking about with Marie. She's a confident mental game. She plays within her bounds, and she executes when the time comes. It's, yeah, she's very impressive. And, I mean, Marie talked about attitude, and I yeah. don't think there's someone on tour that has a better attitude yeah. than own. So, um, 
Just awesome to see. Really, really cool to see her take that one down. You never see her um, do the thing that a lot of golfers do where they refer to themselves by their own first name. <laughs> you ever see that? Like, Jesse, you miss a you miss a shot, you miss a gap or something like that, and you're like, Jesse Tamalti. What are you doing? I call myself something different, and I can't say it on this recording, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stay tuned for the glow round. Yeah, the after show can get that one. Uh, and a Discmania one, too, again. I got to get it in. I was arguing with somebody, maybe somebody related to this podcast, about how the Eagle and Simon trade for Nicholas and Gannon and Kyle wasn't going to work out, and then they've gone one two one two back to back. Pretty nutty. Mm, how do those words taste? Whoever I was talking to that I can't remember. I don't know. I don't remember what we talked about last podcast, so it might have been me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I form my opinions based on the week. Yeah, and forget them by the end exactly. of it. Exactly. <laughs> Usually for me. Much like my disc golf shots, my bad I think, ones. Anyways. I think mostly we talked about teeth. But <laughs> if I'm going to buy one disc this week, is it going to be one of those crazy, pres- I don't even know the MVP disc names, one of those phoenixes from Eagle McMahon or a Nicholas Antelo with a cowboy hat on top of it? I might still buy Nicholas- a cool phoenix one. I think Nicholas's stamp is actually pretty funny because it's the lion from the Nordic Phenom stamp. With the same cowboy hat on? tiger, with a cowboy hat. So it's like his logo again, not just like a Tony yeah. the Tiger with some funky headwear kind of thing. Listen, I think maybe we've, maybe we might have had this debate offline. But at what point does a manufacturer stop printing a disc every time somebody wins a tournament? Like, can we not? Is there not another way to recognize and compensate these players aside from like, oh, congratulations on the, uh, you know, open at Belmont, you know, in May? I know what you mean. This is going to be a longer sidetrack than uh, maybe we're planning for, but. <laughs> like, majors, major rolls. championships, 100%. Absolutely every major championship, even Champions Cup, you win one, you get a commemorative disc, I think. First I don't. career win, commemorative disc. It's like the uh, the hockey game puck. You get one for your first one, you get one for your first yeah, hat trick, you get one for your whatever. They don't give you like 43rd, <laughs> 43rd imagine goal of my career. Chris, <laughs> imagine all the Chris and Tatar um, guess that they would have out if they gave her disc for commemorative disc for you could have a whole bag of chris and tatar commemorative discs yeah they run out of the molds yeah (laughs) they i wonder if somebody's done that before if they just have a bag because you got i'm sure she's put her name on like pures graces obviously she must have put her name on like one or two other discs at some point they someone should just do a full bag of them Kristen bag yeah and then if she wins Worlds this year, she gets a bag with her name on it. Commemorative bag. Well. I'm just saying, at, at some point, like, they're gonna st- we're going to stop doing it, and somebody's got to be the first manufacturer who's like, you know what? Good job. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't got to run. Go. Yeah. <laughs> we don't got to have a bunch of stuff. There's got to be, like, a million, like, I know a uh, uh, good friend of the show and fellow commentator Jeremy Goche who has a Mason Ford uh, I, f- I don't even remember a Music City Open Music City Open Music Halo City Sidewinder Open. Halo yeah. Sidewinder nice disc nice stamp but like I wonder if some of those are sitting in a factory somewhere still you know well that's the thing I was going to get to is that I think in uh, many of the cases if these are Nordic Phenom one or two molded discs that weren't stamped that were on a shelf, it's just a way to get some stuff off the shelf. Just like, the, you know, how many Mason Ford discs were sitting there? Probably none. Those Halo Sidewinders were probably part of a TFR program they had sitting on the shelf that weren't moving. And it's a great disc that we'll be able to sell and you'll get a bigger piece of the pie because the mold is good and it doesn't matter if you throw it or not. This is how we're going to give you a financial bump for your success. But once they've stamped it, like what you're, you're kind of stuck with that stamp, aren't you? And then yeah, I think hot stamping happens at a pretty rapid rate, though, so you can f- you can stamp them to order for retailers. Um, um, well, that or would something make sense. similar. All right, all right, I'm with you. 
I'm with you. Okay. I'm changing my mind about this. I love the Mason Ford stamp. I think it's beautiful. I just I him. agree that you're right though. It would be nice to like walk up and say oh, the same thing that we did for everybody every time, whether it was Worlds, USDGC or the Pittsburgh Flying Disc Open, it doesn't matter. You're still getting a plastic frisbee just like all the other times. Yeah. And like I uh, let's say I'm cheering for my favorite disc golfer and they win Jonesboro, like even then I'm still not going to be like, "Whoa, wow, can't wait to have a Jonesboro thing, but just like run oh, a different was, run of their who was stamp, the name you know? that you're in this hypothetical situation. Who was the name you were gonna say? Well, Jesse Tamalti, but I didn't want to embarrass the guy, okay? Okay, and yeah. that's because he hasn't gone down to the play that tournament. I'm sure if he goes down there, he's gonna win that one. Look, if Jesse wins Jonesboro, I'm buying more than just a commemorative yes. disc. Yeah. I'll right. buy the few. Hey, yeah. I'm in touch with an OT now. I'm I might, <laughs> might see big changes this year. Yeah. I I uh, mean why couldn't we set up a series with Marie to like help help Jesse get over the hump? <laughs> Fix Jesse, yeah. episode two. Yeah. Yeah. Diet. No. <laughs> Oh. Uh, we did have some Canadians at uh, at uh, the Open at Austin. Uh, Max and Thomas Gilbert not doing the greatest, uh, finishing 79th, or 79th and 93rd, respectively. And then Vintel Budinski finishing 29th, uh, one spot slash stroke out of cash. Um, unfortunate to, yeah. Those ones stand. Just outside. Um, but there is a tournament going on uh, this weekend. We have just wrapped uh, round one, wrapped up today. We're recording this on Thursday night, um, and it is the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship. Um, and we do have some a few Canadians down there. And Budinski is doing all right. She's tied currently tied for eighth at minus one. Um, and then friend of the show and uh, uh, commentator extraordinary Abby Lee currently tied for fifty fifth. At plus eight, Cat Johnson currently 69th at plus 12. Um, I think the interesting thing about this tournament so far, and I don't know what it is about US, you, the US Women's Disc Golf Championship, especially lately, but like people like Paige Pierce not really showing up really all that well. Yeah, she's 64th. Podcast yeah. bump worked. We're beating Paige Pierce. <laughs> totally. Um, some other notables in that area, Paige. Chu is also um, not having the best. And then, yes, yeah, Cynthia Ricciotti. So there's some names that they're in the, in the same groupings with. So uh, uh, Maybe we should check back in with Gabby or somebody after uh, after the tournament, see if things went as they expected or not. Because Totally. I'm, I'm looking at it. It looks like you're gaining as much as 20 strokes, 15 stroke, or 15, sorry, 20 spots, 15 spots per stroke. Um, depending on where some of these ties are. I mean, top 20 is still at plus one or plus two. When I was Very interesting for like half of that interview with Marie, I was thinking about like, if, if I'm dynamic discs, for example, like, would you not pay to have an OT on the road with Kona Panis, Kona Montgomery for like a month? Right now with... Yeah, I know she's had mental struggles with her putting and stuff and disc golf related. She just is getting back on tour after her cancer scares that she had. It'd make yeah. a ton of sense, especially with the money they've got invested in her. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you? Worst, worst thing it can do is nothing. Best thing it can do is, like, turn somebody's life around professionally, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you know anybody who works over at DD, tell them we know. We know some people and they know some people. And, Cause yeah, it's In like a stack of Marie business cards. It is like an individual sport like disc golf, I think would benefit almost more than anything from a combination of mental and physical, um, like a more holistic overall view to your occupation. Cause it is, I would say 50, 50 mental and physical as a profession. Yeah. It's something I hadn't considered before that that field would be doing both. That's something that like refined motor skills, like she was talking about, uh, and mental game affects us. But can you imagine somebody in say billiards or something like that, where it's even more mental and even more refined? Okay. That I want to compare us to billiards. We are much more of a sport <laughs> than billiards. Nobody heard me say billiards, but uh, yeah, it's really really interesting. Yeah, Got you from the record. How many billiards podcasts are there? Like one. 
thousand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't want to jump away from USWDGC yet. I didn't get to see uh, enough of the coverage. I only got to see a few minutes of the live. Um, this course is new to the USWDGC, and it's it looks it looks good, very good, and uh, like a very very good challenge for this field too. Mm-hmm. The range of scores is crazy. Yeah, I, I even just seeing Gabby's post and Kat's post and. Um, you know, all the other ladies that are down there, it's all, it looks like a, some fantastic holes um, that they're being played. And, and hoping, I didn't get a chance to catch it today, and not tomorrow, but I'm hoping to be able to catch a little bit of the action this weekend. So It would be so cool to see a Canadian in contention. So obviously pulling for all of them. Chantel's had a sick first round is really nice to see and um yeah even um gabby was playing really well she sort of blew up on the final hole ran into a rough one still played above her rating but like aside from one disastrous hole she's really playing consistently and well so mm. be awesome to see a canadian woman up there especially because yeah. it's their championship and a Can- and an american woman won our championship <laughs> <laughs> totally uh Hopefully, uh, one of the things that I hope doesn't happen is uh, that we don't get any weather delays because that seems to be the trend so far this year in Disc Golf Pro Tour events. Uh, weather affecting every single event so far, as in the two that have three that have happened. So, I think it's not uncommon for this stretch of the tour to have to have weather, and I think I never really paid attention to it until I noticed here that it must be with temperature change, spring and fall in particular the greater winds are shifting and you'll have prevailing winds for a, a month or two and then another month or two on the end with calmer mm-hmm. weather in the middle. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I don't want to say the climate's changing, boys, but it's possible the climate's <laughs> changing and we're getting more extreme weather than we used to before. Just saying, no, I'm, I don't want to go on on a limb and be controversial here on the podcast that's about disc golf. But... And it is, there, it, it is. There may seriously. be an existential threat to the sport that we play and love. Yes. Uh, skiing, right? Yes. I mean, this billiards. One, yeah. Shortage of tooth donors. <laughs> totally. Uh, Next yeah, time I, mean, I go donate I thought, blood, I'm going to be like, how are you guys doing for teeth while we're at it? <laughs> <laughs> like, can we escort this man out of the building, please? He's asking which of his teeth would be best to donate. How many teeth are you allowed to donate per per year? Like, is there a monthly limit or like teeth how fast do they grow back? <laughs> right, uh, I do want to touch on the weather a little bit more because the open at Austin obviously had the major delay. Funny, I actually, I caved because I was like, you know what? I got a little bit of time this weekend. I'm going to watch a little bit of disc golf, watch a little bit of the FPL first round. And then I went to turn it on for the second round and it was in, literally in the middle of the week. So uh, I ended up going back so I could see what was happening. And then um, the, the big thing though, is that the MPO, they made a decision, preemptive decision to reduce the amount of holes played on the MPO side for that round um, by three holes. And, you know, they, I think believe they picked the three holes that had the least amount of um, score separation. So, um, I think that was a solid move. What do you guys think? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, but those would be the best holes to remove, right? Uh, the ones that are not deciding the tournament. If 90% of the field gets the same score, it, it's not changing things as much as the others. It's kind of the lesser of the evils, I guess. I loved it, and I was so impressed that they, like, they got the round in and and... Antelo was putting out like at dusk basically and to make that decision on the ground in real time is so hard to do as a TD you're like looking around you're like I hope the weather doesn't come back like you're checking the radar like the Formula One teams and to, I, I think they absolutely nailed it. No, nobody had to come back another day they didn't have a two round champion like they, they squeezed in as much disc golf as they possibly could have with the weather limitations. And, yeah, super impressive. 
Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, especially given the circumstances, that was the best way to handle it. I, I think it kind of depends on, you know, it's a case by case basis too, because if there had been any more weather delay, I'm sure that would have affected the decision, right? Because then you might not be able to get all the rounds and all the cards coming in the light so what do you even do like if it, if the weather delay happens let's say it's you know there's four cards left on the course finishing 15 16 17 and 18 and the rest but the rest of the field is finished and they're in like what do you do 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 you keep four cards around on monday like can you do that can can people play like some of the cards play those holes on a different day in different conditions is i don't even know the can. rules about that no, the rules are that they can play it on a different day. And oftentimes, if the, like the last four cards get cut off on a Saturday, they'll play them Sunday morning. Yeah. And you bring up something interesting where a lot of pro disc golfers have second jobs and stuff like that. And maybe not on the pro tour because they're driving, but a local A tier could still have $15,000, $20,000 in, in the pot. And then you have to work on Monday. And you're one of the four or people that needs to finish up. Even if you're like a full time touring pro and you got to like, you got to find another Airbnb. You got to move. Like you got to finish your round Sunday. You've already checked out. Everything's loaded up into your van and then you got to find another Airbnb. Yeah. It's not ideal. Yeah. Like these aren't all Ricky Wysockis of the world, you know, so a lot of these well, touring pros pictures are... of his house. <laughs> yeah. It looks great. I want to stay there, man. Right? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. I'm sad when I was there that it wasn't listed cause I would have for sure stayed there. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I thought I thought they did a good job of it, though. What would you? What did you think, Andre? No, I yeah, the, I think they nailed it. I don't think you can really, yeah, I I don't think you can cut the field like some people were calling for, not in a three day event like that, where the issue is. Yeah, you're talking about like Especially. okay, let's just have the cut and and three strokes below that they all play eighteen holes. And the hopeless losers don't get to play at all. Is that was that kind of the other option exactly. people were thinking of? Yeah, yeah, because then you're reducing the amount of cards, right? So. Yeah, I shouldn't say hopeless losers. They're all much better than me, even the most hopeless of the losers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what does that make you? Yeah, I think I mean, I'd rather see the whole round get played. Actually, is that contentious? I would happily cut the bottom ten percent hopeless losers. <laughs> um, or some, depending how far the cut has to go, you don't you don't want to cut so close to the cash line that you're making cash decisions. Because everybody's capable of eighteen down. Yeah, but if you're plus forty and the leader is, or the cash line's at twenty under, because it's a you know just someone that wasn't having their weekend, and you can cut these type of players, I think I'd rather see the full eighteen played. I, There's something about the stamina of finishing an eighteen hole round that is part of the structure of what is the challenge of the round of disc golf too. And I think maintaining that as much as possible is probably the most accurate result to what a disc golf tournament finish would look like. Okay. Yeah. How about I agree, instead 20 jumping there. jacks and 15 holes? Yeah, you have to do bogey push-ups <laughs> yeah. at the Pro Tour. You have, to, you have to skip down the holes that you're not throwing. <laughs> <laughs> we're skipping these uh, holes. Oh, we're not going to get to play 13? No, 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 no. We're skipping. We're skipping. <laughs> Rope is optional, kid. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think uh, I think that does make sense in the uh, especially in a scenario like at, at Austin where it was the third round. But what happens if it's the second round? That's not. I don't think you can do a cut in the second round, right? Because that's before like, the second round. Unless it is. Unless you're talking about if you're talking about ten percent, you're talking about the people that are like. And strokes back of, yeah, cash line or something like that. Yeah, and I, like I said, I think in a three round tournament you have to do it after the second round, and it can. I think it only affects the final round. Four round tournament, you could only get away with that before the final round. Yeah, there, any other one, the too much of the story hasn't been told yet. I'm curious if we'll see something come into play next year officially from the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the PDGA working on the sort of official rule on that. Well, I had to do the lightning delay for Raven's Nest two yeah. years ago now. Yeah. 
And, uh, this is going to sound bad because I just passed my officials test and didn't have to think of this, but um, <laughs> it's something like you must delay it for an hour before you're even given the option to cancel or reschedule. You're required to sit and wait that time out. And I think that might be the extent of the rule, but this would be a good one to look up for later because that stops like lazy TDs. Maybe that's not the right word. Something like that from preemptively calling and to say, whatever, move on. You guys have to play in the morning. Um, well, I can change in an hour or a lot of people can get wet and a lot of equipment can get damaged by having to stay there. Not sure what the real right call is. You got to be an official to be a TD, right? Correct. Or play a major NT. Or play a major or, NT. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. 30, 30 uh, minutes. Oh, I thought it was an hour. A director will evaluate conditions and assign a time not less than 30 minutes the suspension signal for the players to return for a resume re, or a resume time or delay renewal. I thought it was an hour too, but I'm a lapsed official, so I got an excuse. Uh, I, if you haven't no, done I the officials test, minutes. <laughs> if you haven't done the officials test for everyone, all you listeners out there, it's it's kind of worth paying the money to get your official status because like 100%. studying, it's an open book test. So don't stress out about it too much, but you learn so much about the rules of disc golf when you do that. Yeah. Well, and you only pay if you pass. Yeah. And you so. want to hold the certification. So if you and your buddy want to test yourself, anyone listening to this that wants to do something with a disc golf friend on a rainy day, take the test and just like maybe compare scores with each other. Learn something, have a little knowledge off. And if you want to pay the 10 bucks after you pass, then you're a certified official for three years. Should we do one on a podcast at some point? <laughs> Uh, I did mine as closed book and asked. Whoa. Like, uh, two okay, weeks show ago, off. So. Okay, show off. Look Watch at out, you. boy. I'm coming. All right. All right. Hey. Sounds like we've got a content coming. You know what I didn't know? I'm not, I, I, I thought I knew all the rules. I learned this on Twitter. Follow us. There's almost no content on there, but you should follow us anyway. You uh, X. If you play... If you're playing a tournament and you throw your disc into a pretty large puddle and there's no mention <laughs> yes. of it at all in the caddy book or the player's meeting, do you play it from the puddle or do you play it as casual water by default? Casual as default. Casual. Yeah. What a weird rule. Who's this rule invented by? The shoe people? <laughs> I just assumed you'd have to, like, it'd be up to the TD. But I guess, like, it rains on Saturday night and there's just this huge unplayable part of the course. I guess that is not really feasible. I think it just saves some of the... It's like the uh, two-meter rule. Many years ago, it was automatically in effect, and you have to say that it wasn't, and then they changed it. So you say that it is in effect and is by default not. And I think might have been a shuffle of that uh, casual water rule as well sometime during that era. Okay, so now if it's really mushy ground, let's say the water is like halfway up the blade of grass, you know what I mean? It's like kind of swampy. Is that casual water? I think that's a card decision. Well, I think what Matt's alluding to is that the whole fairway could be casual water in a swampy field. Sure, or even just like you throw your, it's just like kind of wet and you don't want to like sink your thing. shoe that's in and a, get your feet soaked. Like, can't, why can't you just take casual, it back 15 feet, right? The casual rule is like you could still, play, like, the, the, you don't, you have the option of putting your foot in the water. Yeah, but it doesn't like, how is it? It must be a card decision then whether it counts as casual water or not. Because otherwise, like, there's just a wet part of the fairway and I think I have a better shot from 15 feet behind me. Yeah, it's wet at the base of this tree. Let's give myself some free clearance because I'm going to call this casual water. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I assumed it wouldn't Cart be casual by default. Uh, but, And also, like, TDs have to mention relief areas, right? So yes. I would have thought they would have also, had to also mention casual water, but no. Provisionals. That's what provisionals are for as well. As if it's like, you know, if you have any question or any doubt, Call provisionals, play both, ask the TD after. Good call. Provisionals, rule. <laughs> rule. 
<laughs> I thought it was interesting, but it's like, uh, yeah, that's why it's fun to do the officials test is because there's all kinds of rules that you think you know, because some dude at league told you that uh, you can't call yourself on a foot fault and nobody disagreed with them. And then you've just taken that with you your whole life. And then all of a sudden you look in the rule book and you absolutely are allowed to call yourself fun in any kind of infractions and you learn something new about the rules. It's great. There's nothing more dangerous than either a very new or very old player telling you rules at league night. Yeah. yeah. Someone got mad at me one time because I didn't mark my disc with a mini and I played from behind my regular disc. <laughs> he told me that was a rule. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Excuse me? It's, yeah, the rules of disc golf should not be a game of telephone. No. I once played with a guy who step putted inside circle one and not and and stationary outside because he thought that was the rules. Was that in Fernie when I was Yes. I had to I think I had to rules them as your caddy, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. I our cad we were playing pretty casual there and then I ended up mentioning it to him a few times for the round. I remember him being a good sport. He just really didn't. Yeah. He just really, truly didn't know. Didn't know. And it was uh, on a card with a bunch of n new players. <laughs> you can guess by the card that I'm describing how well I did at that tournament. So, And you were the most experienced by like 10 tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> Easily. Yeah. It was nice yeah. of them to let you play FJ15. I know, hey? Yeah. Oh, wait, Scanning that's a female. Like MJ, I meant MJ. <laughs> 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 that honest mistake, for real. Uh huh. Mm. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, that's all I got for uh, today's episode. I don't know if you guys got anything else you want to bring up. Oh, I do have one more thing. First, if you guys want to bring anything up, go ahead. We have a giveaway. <gasps> um, last episode. Uh, wait, no, that's no, that's not. No, that's. Uh, no, that's not it. Oh. Um, I blew it, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think you nailed it. <laughs> we give Almost it away. Every single sound in our soundboard. <laughs> uh, we have the uh, Almost. 23rd. You know what we missed, though? What's the disc? <laughs> 23rd. Big Bear Classic. Uh, Paradigm. Paradigm. Wait, didn't, guy, we, didn't, uh, we, didn't we say we were going to give this away last podcast? We were going to give it away. We did the post, and now we're going to give it away now. Oh, we're actually giving it away. People responded to the post. Yeah, we're giving it away. Do you even work it's here? It's a giveaway. No, I have no idea right. what's going on. Yes, <laughs> and uh, for that, Matt, you get to pick the lucky person. We have 34 people eligible for this. And, wow. of course, if you are a patron, you are automatically entered into win. Uh, and, of course, you can get your bonus entries by participating on the social media posts. So. All right. um, multiple ways to win, but uh, Patreon's the best way. Are they are they randomly awesome. assorted? Like, is it all the patrons in one chunk? Okay, okay. Patrons and eligible commenters randomly sorted. Okay. If we're trying to rig it, I'll, I'll, I'll look and give you Morse code with my eyes. One through 34. Uh, you know what we're going to do? We are going to pull a random card from the... Uh, 48 major and minor scales deck. Nice. <laughs> and the scale is uh, B minor natural. And that uh, means? Well, it says six of spades, so I'm going to go with six. All right. Micah Thorson. A patron. Uh, he's, I think he's been a patron for a while. Um, Micah, you can have that disc coming your way. Hell Thank you so yeah. much for being a patron. We appreciate you. I Thank love you, it Micah. Goes to a longtime supporter. Yeah, thanks so much for supporting the show. And you are going to love the paradigm if you like throwing discs real far. It's one of my all time so favorite drivers. Totally. And if you don't like it, we'll work something out in the back end. You know? <laughs> yeah. And Micah is also, he's a uh, $5 patron as well. So extra bonus. 
All right. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's all I got. Because out. Hey, guys. From all of us here at Parked Pro, whether it's your first tooth or your last tooth, make sure it goes to a good home. Um, the tooth um, depository.com is where you send your teeth. And um, if it wasn't for people like you, Andre would still have a big hole in his mouth. So thank you, everyone that donated a tooth this year. It goes a long way. Thank you.